In chapter 21, we will discuss the lymphatic system and immunity. As you can see from the slide, the AIDS epidemic is still an ongoing problem today. In 2008, more than 15% of adults were infected with HIV in certain regions, and that hasn't really changed much in 2012. The current estimates of HIV rates and AIDS can be seen on the CDC's website under their HIV AIDS reporting page. But HIV and AIDS is just one example of the importance of our immune system in trying to fight off viruses like HIV, bacteria, microorganisms, and other pathogens that we may come into contact with. This is one of the functions of our lymphatic system. There are three important functions to the lymphatic system and immunity. The lymphatic system drains interstitial fluid, excess interstitial fluid, from the interstitial space and transports it to the bloodstream. Once this tissue fluid enters into lymphatic vessels, it is no longer called interstitial fluid, but is now referred to as lymph. Any blockage in the normal drainage of lymph produces edema. The lymphatic system houses the phagocytic cells and lymphocytes that clean the tissue fluid before it is dumped into circulation. The lymphatic system absorbs digested fats from the intestine by specialized lymph vessels called lacteals. The fatty lymph is known as chyle. Now the lymphatic system includes the vessels, cells, tissues, and organs responsible for defending the body against both environmental hazards, such as various pathogens that I mentioned previously, and internal threats, like cancer cells. Lymph vessels carry lymph from the peripheral tissues to the venous system. The lymphatic network begins with the lymphatic capillaries, which merge to form progressively larger vessels as they make their way towards circulation. And here you can see the anatomy of the lymphatic system, which includes the vessels, cells, tissues, and the specialized organs of the lymphatic system. One thing to note when talking about the lymphatic system is we must recall what's going on during capillary exchange. Remember that the filtration at the capillaries is a result of the different pressures that are present. The capillary hydrostatic pressure, CHP, and the blood colloid osmotic pressure, BCOP. These two pressures contribute to the overall net filtration pressure. And the difference in these pressures causes either fluid to move out at the arterial end of the capillaries or be pushed in to the capillary bed at the venous end. The lymphatic capillaries are present in almost every tissue and organ in the body and are believed to be as abundant as blood capillaries. Lymph capillaries are absent, however, in areas of the body that lack a blood supply, such as the cornea of the eye, and are also absent from the central nervous system and bone marrow. Lymphatic capillaries differ from blood capillaries in that they are blind-ended tubes, 
They have larger diameters with lower resistance and pressure, have thinner walls that are more permeable, and typically have a flattened or irregular shaped lumen. Although lymphatic capillaries are lined by simple squamous epithelium, the basal lamina is incomplete or absent. Furthermore, the endothelial cells overlap, forming a type of one-way valve called a mini-valve. The mini-valve permits the entry of fluids and solutes like proteins, as well as viruses, bacteria, and cell debris, but prevents their return to the intercellular spaces. The lymph-collecting vessels are from the lymph capillaries where lymph flows into larger lymph-collecting vessels that lead toward the body trunks. And here we can see the major trunks and ducts of the lymphatic system. Like veins, the lymph collecting vessels possess valves which are located very close together and bulge noticeably. As a result, large lymph collecting vessels resemble a string of beads. Pressures within the lymph collecting vessels are very low and the valves are required to prevent the backflow of lymph and to maintain normal lymph flow toward the thoracic cavity. Superficial lymph collecting vessels are located in the subcutaneous layer deep to the skin, in the areolar tissues of the mucous membranes lining the digestive, respiratory, urinary, and reproductive tracts, and in the areolar tissues of the serous membranes lining the pleural, pericardial, and peritoneal membranes. There is also deep lymph collecting vessels that accompany the deep arteries and veins supplying skeletal muscles and other organs of the neck, limbs, trunk, and the walls of visceral organs. The lymph trunks are composed of superficial and deep lymph collecting vessels that converge to form larger vessels known as lymphatic trunks and are named by the areas of the body they drain. The jugular trunks are located in the neck and drain the head. The subclavian trunks are located in the shoulders and drain the arms. The bronchomediastinal trunks are located in the chest and drain the thoracic cavity and lungs. The lumbar trunks are located in the lower back and drain the pelvis and lower limbs. The intestinal trunk is located in the abdomen and drains the wall of the digestive organs. Lymph trunks, trunks merge to form the two largest lymphatic vessels called the right lymphatic duct and the thoracic duct, which you can see in the figure. The right lymphatic duct forms the merger of the right jugular trunk, the right subclavian trunk, and the right bronchomediastinal trunk. The right lymphatic tr duct drains the right side of the head, the right arm, right shoulder, and right side of the thoracic cavity, as noted in the figure. The right lymphatic duct empties into the right subclavian vein. The thoracic duct extends, extends along the left side of the vertebral column, collecting lymph from the left bronchomediastinal trunk, the left subclavian trunk, and the left jugular trunk. At the base of the thoracic duct is an enlarged sac-like chamber called the cisterna chile, which receives lymph from the lumbar trunk and intestinal trunk. The thoracic duct drains the left side of the head, 
the left arm, the left shoulder, and the left side of the thoracic cavity. All of the abdomen, pelvic region, and both legs. The thoracic duct empties into the left subclavian vein. Now, when there is blockage of the lumbar trunks or subclavian trunks by a certain type of worm, this can cause severe lymphedemia known as elephantitis. And you can see a picture of that in the figure. Now let's look at the organization of our immune system. The lymph cells are responsible for the immune functions of the lymphatic system. Although the lymphocytes account for about 20 to 30 percent of the circulating white blood cell population, circulating lymphocytes are only a small fraction of the total lymphocyte population. The majority of lymphocytes reside within the lymph organs of the body, such as the lymph nodes, spleen, tonsils, thymus, etc. And the immune system functions as a barrier defense in our innate immune response and in our adaptive immune response, which we will examine in this chapter. Here you can see the cells of the immune system and immune response and how they differentiate from hematopoietic stem cells. We will go over the different types of cells of the immune system throughout this chapter. Remember, in adults, erythropoiesis is normally confined, confined to red bone marrow, but lymphocyte production, called lymphopoiesis, involves the red bone marrow, thymus, and peripheral lymphoid tissues. And this leads to the development of all of the cells that are present in our immune response. The lymphocytes consist of three classes and circulate in the blood and are sensitive to specific antigens. B cells account for about 10 to 15 percent of circulating lymphocytes. When stimulated by an antigen, B cells differentiate into plasma cells, which produce and secrete antibodies. B cells are said to be responsible for antibody-mediated immunity, also called humoral immunity, because antibodies circulate widely within body fluids and attack targets with foreign antigens. T cells comprise about 80% of the circulating lymphocytes T cells are diverse and provide cell-mediated immunity. NK cells comprise about 5 to 10 percent of circulating lymphocytes and are called natural killer cells or NK cells. This particular group of lymphocytes is part of the body's nonspecific defenses and they attack foreign cells body cells that have become infected with viruses, and cancer cells that appear in normal tissue. Their continuous monitoring of peripheral tissues has been called immunological surveillance. Here you can see the primary lymphatic organs, and in contrast to lymph nodules, these organs are separated from the surrounding tissue by a fibrous connective tissue called the capsule. This includes the lymph nodes, thymus, and spleen. The thymus produces several hormones, collectively called the thymosins, 
that are important to the development of functional T cells and thus to the maintenance of normal body defenses. The thymus is large when a person is born and continues to grow through childhood as the individual is exposed to infection. By puberty, the thymus weighs around 40 grams. However, after puberty, it gradually diminishes in size and becomes increasingly fibrous in a process known as involution. By the time an individual reaches age 50, the thymus may weigh less than 12 grams and is correlated with an increase in susceptibility to infection and disease. The thymus is surrounded by a capsule that divides it into right and left lobes. The fibrous partitions called septa originate at the capsule and divide the lobes into lobules. Each lobule consists of a dark outer cortex and a lighter central medulla. The medulla is dominated by thymic corpuscles not present in the cortex. The bone marrow, or red bone marrow, is a loose collection of cells where hematopoiesis occurs. And the yellow bone marrow is a site of energy storage, which consists largely of fat cells. The B cells undergo nearly all of their development in the red bone marrow, whereas the immature T cells, called a thymocyte, leaves the bone marrow and matures largely in the thymus gland. There is also secondary lymphatic organs. And these are specialized forms of connective tissue called reticular connective tissue, which resembles areolar tissue, but contains larger numbers of collagen, elastin, and reticular fibers. The secondary lymphatic or lymphoid organs consist of the lymph nodes, spleen, and lymph nodules. The lymph nodes are small lymphoid organs ranging in diameter from one millimeter to 25 millimeters. The shape of a typical lymph node resembles that of a kidney bean. The largest collections of lymph nodes are located in the cervical, axillary, an inguinal region of the body. As lymph flows through a lymph node, at least 99% of the antigens in the lymph are removed and the immune response is stimulated as needed. The path of lymph flow through a lymph node is beginning with the afferent lymphatic vessel which transports dirty lymph into the lymph node from the peripheral tissues. The afferent lymphatic vessel penetrates the capsule of the lymph node on the side opposite the hilum. The afferent vessels deliver the lymph to the subscapular space, which is a meshwork of reticular fibers, macrophage, and dendritic cells. Lymph next flows in the outer cortex, which contains B cells within germinal centers that resemble those of lymphoid nodules. Lymph then flows through the lymph sinuses to the deep cortex, which is dominated by T cells. Lymph continues into the medullary sinuses at the core of the lymph node. This region contains B cells and plasma cells. The efferent lymphatic vessels drain the clean lymph out of the lymph node and exit at the hilum. The spleen is the largest lymphoid organ and performs the same functions for blood that the lymph nodes perform for lymph. The spleen removes abnormal red blood cells stores iron from recycled red blood cells, and initiates immune response by T cells and B cells to antigens in the bloodstream. 
The spleen is surrounded by a capsule containing collagen and elastin fibers. The spleen tears so easily that a se seemingly minor impact to the left side of the abdomen can rupture the capsule. Because it is so fragile, it is difficult to repair and is instead typically removed in a process called a splenectomy. Splenic blood vessels and lymphatic vessels communicate with the spleen on the medial surface at the hilum. The medial surface also has two shallow depressions that conform to the shape of the stomach and that of the kidney. Fibrous partitions called trabeculae radiate outward toward the capsule through the interior from the hilum. Blood vessels travel within the trabeculae. The cellular components within the spleen constitute the pulp. The red pulp contains large quantities of red blood cells, whereas the white pulp resembles lymphoid nodules and contains lymphocytes. The unusual circulatory arrangement within the spleen gives the phagocytes of the spleen an opportunity to identify and engulf any damaged or infected cells in the circulating blood. The lymph nodules are areas of densely packed lymph tissue or lymphocytes and their boundaries are not distinct because although they may cluster together and form large masses, there is no fibrous capsule surrounding them. We will examine the tonsils, malt, which consists of Peyer's patches, the appendix, and BALT, which is bronchus-associated lymphoid tissue. The tonsils are large lymphoid nodules in the walls of the pharynx. Left and right palatine tonsils are located at the posterior inferior margin of the oral cavity. A single pharyngeal tonsil, often called the adenoid, lies in the posterior superior wall of the nasopharynx. And a pair of lingual tonsils lies deep to the mucous epithelium covering the base of the tongue. A final pair of tonsils, called the tubal tonsils, is found in the base of each of the pharyngeotympanic tubes. Most of the time, our tonsils go unnoticed unless they are infected and swollen, a condition known as tonsillitis. Malt is mucosa-associated lymphoid tissue and protects the rest of the epithelium of the digestive, urinary, and reproductive tracts from pathogens and toxins. The appendix is a type of malt tissue found at the junction of the large and small intestine and contains rapidly dividing lymphocytes. Peyer's patches is also a type of malt tissue found clustered deep in the epithelial linings of the distal small intestine and is especially important for immune responses against ingested substances. And bronchus associated lymphoid tissue, or BALT, protects the epithelium of the respiratory tract. These are effective against many pathogens that we may inhale. Now let's examine some of the barrier defenses and our innate immune response. There are certain characteristics that some of the surface barriers for our innate and adaptive immune responses are shown here. We first have a physical barrier which keeps hazardous organisms and materials outside the body. The skin is part of our, uh, skin comprises our integumentary system, which provides the major physical barrier to the external environment. The skin also has some modifications to it 
that contribute to this barrier. The epidermis of the skin is composed of stratified squamous epithelium with keratinized cells and a network of desmosomes that lock adjacent cells together. Hairs are found on most areas of the body's surface and provide some protection against mechanical abrasion and they often prevent hazardous materials or insects from contacting the skin. The epidermal surfaces receive the secretions of sweat glands. These secretions, which flush the surfaces to wash away microorganisms and chemical agents, may also contain bactericidal chemicals called defensins, destructive enzymes called lysozymes, and antibodies. The epidermal surface also receives secretions from sebaceous glands. Sebum not only lubricates the skin, but also reduces the amount of free water on the surface of the skin, thereby creating an arid environment that most microorganisms find inhospitable. In addition, we have mucous membranes, which are epithelial linings of the digestive, respiratory, urinary, and reproductive tracts that also provide a barrier which most organisms cannot cross. Mucus bays the surface of the mucous membranes and captures most microorganisms and debris so that it cannot gain entry past the delicate internal passageways. Mucous membranes also secrete chemicals that reduce the growth of microorganisms, such as powerful acids, lysozymes, and defensins. The cells of mucous membranes are held together by numerous tight junctions and supported by a fibrous basal lamina. Mucous membranes also often possess cilia that create an outward wave of movement that transports microorganisms up and out of the body. And mucous membranes possess both malt and bulk tissue. The internal defenses consist of phagocytes, NK cells, antimicrobial, proteins, inflammation, and fever. Let's take a look next at the phagocytic cells. The phagocytic cells are cells that engulf pathogens and cell debris should they make it past the physical barriers created by the skin and mucous membranes. Characteristics that are common to all phagocytic cells are that phagocytic cells can leave capillaries by squeezing between adjacent endothelial cells in a process known as emigration. Phagocytes are attracted to chemicals produced by an infection in a phenomenon called positive chemotaxis. Phagocytosis always begins with the attachment of the phagocyte to the target cell. In this process called adherence, receptors on the plasma membrane of the phagocyte bind to the surface of the target. After attachment, the phagocyte will begin ingestion, digestion, and resolution. And there are different types of phagocytic cells that you can see on the slide. Neutrophils which are the most abundant leukocyte, are highly mobile, quick to phagocytize cellular debris or invading bacteria. Isonophils, which are less abundant than neutrophils, and, have, and they do have limited ability to phagocytize compared to neutrophils. The isonophils engulf foreign pathogens only if they've been coated with antibodies. And the monocytes, which are less numerous than neutrophils, but more numerous than eosinophils. These give rise to types of macrophages, both free and fixed. Cytokines and interferons. Cytokines are also known as chemokines that destroy the organism. Interferons, 
are an example of a cytokine secreted by the lymphocytes, macrophages, and tissues infected with the virus. There are three types of interferons, alpha, beta, and gamma. Alpha is produced by viral infected cells to attract NK cells and enhance resistance to viral infection. Beta interferons secreted by fibroblast will slow inflammation in a damaged area, and gamma interferons are secreted by T cells and NK cells to stimulate macrophage activity. Now let's move on and look at some of the adaptive immunity. As noted previously, there are characteristics of the adaptive immune response. It is specific, systemic, has memory, is versatile, and exhibits tolerance. There are two main types of adaptive defenses, cell-mediated immunity and antibody-mediated immunity. Let's look at cell-mediated immunity first. Cell-mediated immunity is provided by the action of T lymphocytes, which are produced in the red bone marrow, but mature in the thymus gland. T lymphocytes cannot recognize an antigen directly. Instead, the antigen must be processed and presented to the T lymphocyte by either specialized antigen-presenting cells, APCs, or infected body cells. Antigen presentation occurs when glycoproteins on the surface of APCs or body cells display an antigen or a piece of the antigen. These membrane glycoproteins are called major histocompatibility complexes or MHC proteins. And there are two classes of MHC proteins. Class 1 MHC proteins are found on every body cell to allow body cells infected with a virus to alert the immune system that they've been attacked by an infection and reveal the identity of their attacker. Class 2 MHC proteins are found only on the membranes of APCs, which may be macrophages, other phagocytic cells, like neutrophils or eosinophils and dendritic cells. Class II MHC proteins allow antigen-presenting cells to alert the body that infection has been discovered and stimulate other immune system cells to rush to the site of infection to help with the attack. If a body cell becomes infected by a virus, it can alert the body that it has been attacked. Once the virus is inside the body cell, the body cell takes pieces of the abnormal peptides of the virus and incorporates them with MHC proteins on their surface. Typically, body cells, however, do not possess the class II MHC proteins that macrophages possess. Instead, they possess the class 1 MHC protein shown here. And these proteins bind to the foreign antigen and stimulate only cells that possess CD8 markers. CD8 T cells differentiate to form cytotoxic T cells, suppressor T cells, and memory T cells. When the cytotoxic T cell recognize the antigen MHC class 1 complex, the cytotoxic T cells destroy the sick body cell by perforins by activation of genes within the body cell that trigger apoptosis of the body cell and disruption of the cell's metabolism through the release of lymphotoxins. Here you can see an antigen-presenting cell with MHC2. 
When macrophage is patrolling the body, tissues encounter foreign antigens, they engulf them by phagocytosis. Once the organism is inside the macrophage, the macrophage processes the antigen and exposes it on the surface of its own cell in combination with the class II MHC protein. The antigen class II MHC complex can only be recognized by the cell that possesses a special CD4 marker. The only cells that possess the CD4 marker are the CD4 T cells that differentiate to form T helper cells and memory T cells. The helper T cells begin secreting cytokines which now alert other B and T lymphocytes that an infection has been located and guides these cells to the site of infection by positive chemotaxis. And here you can see that process of antigen processing and presentation. This slide shows the T cell receptor and its components. There are um, four different types of T cells that were mentioned. Helper T cells, cytotoxic, cytotoxic T cells, suppressor T cells, and memory T cells. The T cell receptor has a variable region, a constant region, and a region that spans the membrane. The antigen determinants or antigenic determinants are shown here. A typical protein antigen can often have a variety of antigenic determinants and that is shown here by the ability of T cells with three different specificities to bind to different parts of the same antigen. The pathogen presentation process is outlined here for you as well, where the antigen presenting cell or dendritic cell comes into contact with a T cell receptor. Here you can see CD4, which is associated with helper and regulatory T cells, and when an extracellular pathogen is processed and presented in the binding of a class II MHC molecule, that interaction is strengthened by the CD4 molecule. CD8, remember, is associated with cytotoxic T cells. And an intracellular pathogen is presented by a class I MHC molecule, then CD8 would interact with it. The different types of T cells are shown here and what they can stimulate and produce in response to our immunity. Helper T cells, also known as TH cells or CD4 cells, cytotoxic T cells or TC cells, which are also called killer T cells, suppressor T cells or TS cells, and memory T cells. And T cell differentiation is noted here. This slide outlines the stimulation and clonal expansion of T cells that we discussed previously, differentiating between the class II MHC proteins, which respond to and can be recognized by cells possessing a CD4 marker and these will become our T helper cells and memory T cells, as well as our class I MHC proteins that stimulate cells possessing the CD8 markers. These cells will differentiate to form cytotoxic T cells, suppressor T cells, and memory cells. And here you can also see that process outlined showing the clonal expansion of the T lymphocytes.
Now let's look at some of the adaptive immune responses involving the B lymphocytes and antibody-mediated immunity. Antibody-mediated immunity has certain properties associated with it. It is provided by the action of B lymphocytes, which are produced in the red bone marrow and remain there to mature. It's also called humoral immunity because B lymphocytes attack the infection or their antigens while in the body fluids, blood, lymph, interstitial fluid, etc. Although B lymphocytes reside in the spleen and lymph nodes, many are also circulating in the body fluids where they can directly recognize infection or their antigens and then undergo clonal expansion. And that sensitization and clonal expansion of B lymphocytes is as follows. Activated B lymphocytes begin to prol proliferate rapidly, forming a clone army. This initial response to exposure to an antigen is called the primary response. Because the antigen must activate the appropriate B cells, the primary response takes time to develop. During the primary response, the antibody titer, or level of antibody activity in the plasma, does not peak until one to two weeks after the initial exposure. And after those B cell clones mature, they differentiate into plasma B cells and memory B cells. We then have the secondary response, where antibody titers increase more rapidly and can reach levels many times greater than they did in the primary response. The secondary response is triggered even if the second exposure occurs years after the primary exposure. The antibody structure, here you can see T and B cell binding to elicit a response to a T cell dependent antigen. The B and T cells must come close together and to become fully activated, the B cell must receive signals from the native antigen and the T cell cytokines. Helper T cells and B cells are shown here. After initially binding an antigen to the B cell receptor, a B cell can internalize the antigen and present it on its MHC class 2. A helper T cell recognizes the MHC class 2 antigen complex and activates the B cell. As a result, memory B cells and plasma cells are made. Plasma cells can secrete free antibodies that attack the current infection and or the antigens of the infection. Memory B cells remain in reserve and are primed to respond quickly to subsequent exposures to infections with the same antigen. So that the next time you encounter the infection, memory B cells can generate a faster, more efficient response, known as the secondary response. Plasma cells, um, once the infection is defeated, plasma cells will undergo apoptosis or programmed cell death. The antibodies secreted by the plasma cells will remain in circulation for an extended amount of time even after the infection is over. Cell-mediated immunity is shown here. And cell-mediated immunity does have certain properties. It is provided by the action of T lymphocytes, which are produced in the red bone marrow, but ensure in the thymus gland. And as noted before, T lymphocytes cannot recognize an antigen directly. They have to have an antigen-presenting cell present the cell. 
antigen presentation, remember, occurs when glycoproteins on the surface of antigen presenting cells or body cells present an antigen or a piece of an antigen. And the helper T cell becomes activated by binding to the antigen presented by an antigen presenting cell or the MHC2 receptor causing it to release cytokines. Depending on the cytokines released, it can activate either the humoral or the cell-mediated immune response. This shows the antibody structure, and you can see that an antibody consists of four polypeptide chains, one pair of heavy chains on the interior and one pair of light chains on the exterior. The four chains are held together by disulfide bonds. Each of the four chains has a constant region where the amino acid sequence is the same and a variable region where the amino acid sequence is unique. The constant segments of the heavy chains form the base of the antibody molecule. The free tips of the two variable segments form the antigen binding sites of the antibody molecule. These sites can interact with an antigen in the same way as an active site of an enzyme interacts with its substrate. When an antigen, or I'm sorry, when an antibody molecule binds to its corresponding antigen, we now have an antigen antibody complex that has been formed. There are five classes of antibodies or immunoglobins shown here. The classes are determined by differences in the structure of the heavy chain constant regions and so they have no effect on the antibody specificity, which is determined by the antigen binding sites out on the variable region of the chains. IgA is a dimer found primarily in glandular secretions such as mucus, tears, saliva, breast milk, sweat, and semen. These antibodies attack the pathogens before they gain access to internal tissues. IgD is a monomer found on the surface of B cells where it can bind antigens in the extracellular fluid. This binding plays a role in the sensitization of the B cell so that it can proliferate to form the clone army. IgE is a monomer that attaches as an individual molecule to the exposed surface of basophils and mast cells which, it, which initiate the inflammatory response via histamine and heparin. IgG accounts for 80% of all antibodies. IgG antibodies are responsible for the resistance against many viruses, bacteria, and bacterial toxins. IgG are monomers and can cross the placenta. IgG antibodies cause the effects of hemolytic disease of the newborn, which we will discuss later. IgM is a pentamer secreted after an antigen is encountered. IgM concentrations decline as IgG production accelerates. The anti-A and anti-B antibodies responsible for the agglutination of the incompatible blood types are IgM antibodies. Here you can see the clonal selection of the B cell response, which we discussed earlier. This would be the sensitization and clonal expansion of B lymphocytes and it outlines the primary response, which leads to the antibody titer, the differentiation of the two types of B cells into plasma B cells and memory B cells, and what happens during the secondary response. Now, 
the antibody defense mechanisms are shown here. Antibodies use many different mechanisms to destroy antigens. Because each antibody can form a different function, they are said to be versatile. Neutralization is one mechanism, and this is where both viruses and bacterial toxins must bind to the plasma membrane of body cells before they can enter or injure those cells. Antibodies can block the binding sites so the viruses or toxins cannot bind to the body cells. This is called neutralization. Opsonization is when antibodies can coat the surface of pathogens so the pathogens become sticky and are more susceptible to phagocytosis. Complement activation occurs upon binding to an antigen and portions of the antibody molecule change shape, exposing areas that bind complement proteins. The bound complement molecule then activates the complement system, which destroys the antigen by lysis or enhancing phagocytosis. Here you can see the antibody response in both primary and secondary exposures. And this really does outline how during the secondary immune response, the antibody levels can become substantially greater and the titers can reach a much higher level. And that's because the during the secondary response, the memory B cells are there in the body in reserve and are already primed to respond quickly to that subsequent exposure. The development of humoral immunity is outlined here for you, showing both aspects of active or passive. Active can occur from naturally acquired infection or contact with a pathogen. Artificially acquired occurs via vaccine that is dead or an attenuated pathogen. Passive exposure can also be naturally acquired or artificially acquired. Naturally acquired, an example would be when antibodies pass from the mother to the fetus via the placenta or during breastfeeding. Artificially acquired may occur with the injection of an immune serum like gamma globulin. The immune response has many different pathways that we have discussed in which the body can respond. The complement cascade pathway is shown here which we discussed previously. And remember, this is a function in the innate immune response. Complement is made in the liver and using what is known as the alternate pathway occurs during complement activation. Complement functions in the adaptive immune response go via the classical pathway. It is consisting of many different proteins that can alter and fragment later proteins in a series of events called a cascade. Antibody defense mechanisms are shown here, which we also discussed demonstrating the presentation of the pathogen, precipitation and agglutination, how phagocytes are attracted, and that can stimulate the inflammatory response. Here you can see IgA immunity. The um, example shown here in the slide involves nasal associated lymphoid tissue and Peyer's patches of the small intestines. They can generate IgA immunity and use M cells to transport antigens inside the body 
in order to enhance and mount the immune response. So those are a couple of examples of different types of immune responses that the body has in order to protect itself from the many different microorganisms, bacteria, or pathogens that we can become exposed to every day. There's also many different immune system disorders that can occur. Immunodeficiency, allergies or hyposensitivity, autoimmune diseases, and graft rejections. Let's first look at immunodeficiency. Immunodeficiency means a deficient number of immune system cells. Severe combined immunodeficiency, or SCID, is a syndrome that is a congenital condition resulting from a genetic disorder leading to deficits in both B and T cells. Acquired immune deficiency syndrome, or AIDS, is caused by the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, and is a condition that destroys the helper T cells, thereby depressing cellular-mediated immunity. Most patients die of opportunistic infections like the flu or pneumonia if they have AIDS. And you can also see the progression of the disease over time in the slide and how that impacts the T helper cells. Immune hypersensitivity or hypersensitivity in general is an allergy and occurs when the antibody response is so severe it causes tissue damage as it fights off a perceived infection or allergen that would otherwise be harmless to the body, like pollen or pet dander. Immediate hypersensitivity or type 1 begins within seconds of exposure and lasts half, half an hour to one hour approximately. An example of this might be anaphylactic shock or allergic rhinitis. Subacute hypersensitivity has an onset within one to three hours after exposure and the duration is 10 to 15 hours. An example of this would be type 2, such as occurs during the transfusion of mismatched blood, or type 3 would be a farmer's lung. Delayed hypersensitivity occurs within one to three days and lasts for a week or more. An example of this would be contact dermatitis like poison ivy or even a tuberculosis skin test. Now there are many different forms of autoimmune diseases. An autoimmune disease occurs when B cells make antibodies against normal body tissue. These misguided antibodies are called autoantibodies. There are numerous autoimmune diseases, some of which are shown here. Multiple sclerosis is where autoantibodies attack the white matter of the nervous system, leading to demyelination of neurons, which can cause weakness or even paralysis. Rheumatoid arthritis is when autoantibodies destroy the connective tissues associated with the joints or the joint capsule. Systemic lupus erythromatosis is when autoantibodies attack many organs. Graves disease is where autoantibodies attack thyroid tissue causing an excess production of thyroxin, a thyroid hormone. Type 1 diabetes, also known as insulin-dependent diabetes, is when autoantibodies attack the pancreatic cells that produce insulin. Lamerulonephritis is when autoantibodies attack the kidneys, leading to renal dysfunction. And hemolytic disease of the newborn is shown here, 
which is also known as erythroblastosis fatalis. And this is when there is an incompatibility of the RH factor between the mom and the baby, which was not resolved after the first pregnancy. Sarcoma is shown here, in particular Carposi's sarcoma lesions. And graft rejection is another type of immune system disorder. And this can result from tissues, organs, or blood transplants that are not compatible with the tissues of the recipient. They are recognized as non-self and are attacked. In order to reduce rejection, the best possible match is always sought and immunosuppressant drugs are used. An autograft is a tissue from the same person. An isograft is a tissue from a genetically identical twin. An allograft is tissues from a non-genetically identical person. And a xenograft is when tissues are used from organisms of different species. This concludes our overview of the lymphatic system and immunity.